Okay. Welcome everyone to uh, session two of the Urban Green series. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that. Um, Helen, do you want to fill us in um, who that group was? Sure. So that was um, You Are What You Eat from Formidable Vegetable Sound System. Great. And you might remember Formidable Vegetable Sound System um, was the opener for our, for our last session. So check them out. So got a couple of people logging in. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a little bit of housekeeping. So um, like last week, um, a few of you might have sat in. We might use the annotate function at times during this meeting. And if we do, I'll just put some instructions up on the screen for you so you can easily use that. We'll use that towards the end of the um, session this time. And um, just to let you know, um, the session is uh, being recorded. Uh, so um, we're going to develop the video into outreach material, much like we did um, last week. Um, throughout the session, if you want to ask a question, um, there are a few options. You can raise a virtual hand and we can um, stop the presentation and um, go to your question and you can ask it out loud. You can wait to, until um, the uh, question breaks. So we'll stop regularly to ask if you have any questions from the group. Um, or you can ask a question in the chat function. If you want to um, remain anonymous, we can read out a question from the chat or we can type answers into the chat as we go. So um, just a bit of a reminder, some um, faces that you'll come across over the next few weeks. Helen McGregor, you might remember Helen from last week if you sat in. Helen's going to be giving a talk in week four and kicked off um, session one with a, a talk about a urban biosecurity study Helen and I are doing together. This is myself, Jess Lai. Um, I'll be doing another talk today after a presentation by Lizzie on beneficials. We have a talk uh, next week by Dr. Leah Pirtle from CESAR on um, how to monitor pests in your garden and report anything unusual. Uh, but tonight we have a very um, special guest, Dr. Lizzie Lowe from Macquarie University is going to kick things off with a presentation, a presentation about beneficial insects and spiders in your garden and how to encourage them. So over to you, Lizzie. Perfect. Um, I, thanks for coming so much, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you today because I'm talking about my absolute favourite topic, which is all the good bugs in your garden. And um, you may find that over the course of this talk, you see a little bit of a bias towards spiders. And that is because I'm a spider researcher. So I'm an academic at Macquarie University and I did my PhD in urban spiders and I'm now looking at how we can use spiders and good bugs in our gardens instead of using pesticides. So that's my background and today I'm going to introduce you to the wonderful world of insects and what they can do for us. Um, I like the, the theme of this week which is all about ecology and the ecology of your back garden and I have always considered gardens as part of an ecosystem. Um, we've got a, a raised hand already. I love the questions. Kaz, did you want to ask a question? Or are you just testing out the raised hand? For, uh, um, that's fine too. <laughs> um, Jess, I can't actually see the chat when my screen is full, so you'll have to let me know if there's any good chat questions. No problem. Um, I love thinking about gardens as ecosystems because when you think about it, if you're in an urban area, a lot of the urban landscape is actually people's back gardens and to me this is really fascinating because you talk about trying to increase urban biodiversity or trying to manage an urban ecosystem but if you just look at one suburb you've got probably hundreds or thousands of different managers managing their tiny little plot and we've all got a kind of different way of how we want our garden to be we all use slightly different methods for planting plants or um, encouraging wildlife or or not encouraging them and you end up with this amazing patchwork ecosystem, which is a super, super complex ecosystem. Um, and we want to be able to understand how these work together and how we can actually encourage, um, the, encourage these ecosystems to, to still work to some extent. We want them to function as natural ecosystems to give us all the benefits that we need from them. So when we're talking about insects, um, I always like to start with the ecosystem services that insects can provide. Now an ecosystem service is basically anything that humans can get from, from nature. And when we're talking about big bugs, there's a huge amount of services that we can get from insects. 
Um, starting off with just basically, they're a really good source of food. So there are lots of insects um, that I eat other insects, but also of course birds that are insectivorous. Um, mammals, all sorts of small mammals rely on insects and reptiles as well. So if you got rid of all the bugs in the ecosystem, you'd have some very hungry other animals out there as well. I've got education down the corner there because bugs are an amazing way to learn about nature. We really want people to appreciate nature and we want it to be a part of our lives. And if you can't see it, then you can't love it. So I think bugs are a really great way to get people engaged with nature and what's living around them. Pollination is a pretty straightforward one. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and decomposition is another really important service that I'll explain what's going on in your back garden. Medicine and materials, this is a really interesting one that I can't go into too much today because I don't have enough time. But we can actually use the venoms from things like spiders to create biopesticides and create um, things like cancer treatments for humans from the venoms of spiders. So this is just another little reason of why we can't kill off all the insects in the world because they're giving us some really, really beneficial medicines and materials. Seed dispersal is this little one up the top that I like to talk about very quickly. And it's basically the fact that some plants have evolved this little white um, nutrients on the top of their seed and the ants love this. And they will go out of their way to collect these seeds. They take those seeds and they take them back into this and they bury them down in the ground. And then um, the plant grows up um, a nice distance away from the mother plant. And um, so this um, ant has basically done the seed dispersal for this tree. And there are a lot of Australian trees that now rely on ants to disperse their seeds for them. And finally, pest control. So um, predatory spiders and insects are very, very good at controlling pests. And we can reduce the amount of insecticides we use if we can rely on some of these little guys instead. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about these um, predatory insects a bit later. But of course, it's not all good stuff. There are a lot of bad things that can come from particular species in urban areas as well. We have to be aware of mosquitoes because they can carry diseases. They can damage the plants and vegetables that we try and grow in our gardens and they can cause property damage as well. So when we're talking about insects and spiders in urban ecosystems, it's a really um, delicate balance between encouraging the good bugs and still having to deal with the bad bugs and the impacts that they have. So when we're talking about beneficial insects and spiders today, I'm gonna to cover pollinators, decomposers, and the predators and parasitoids. Talking about decomposition, this is a really, really important service um, that happens in your back garden. The decomposers are the ones that are the larger bugs and they come in and they break down the dead plant and animal matter in your back garden. So if we're going through this exercise of thinking about what would happen if we killed off all the bugs, imagine if you killed off the decomposers, you would have all the leaf litter, all of the excrement, all of the dead animals in your back gardens and in the urban areas building up over time and you wouldn't have those nice nutrients returned to the soil. What these physical decomposers do is they create this organic layer on the top of the soil and that's when the chemical decomposers can come in and they break those chemicals right back down into the good nutrients that will then circulate back into your soil. So when we're talking about the kind of insects and um, invertebrates that are really good um, decomposers, we've got things like mites, millipedes, centipedes, snails, slaters, all these kind of things, they're not particularly um, uh, well thought of. Um, people don't say that they love these kind of invertebrates and often you would kind of find people trying to get rid of them but these are really really important parts of people's back gardens and there are so many different types of invertebrates that will help to break down um, the nutrients in your back gardens. So when we're talking about the impacts to soils and some soils have been quite badly degraded over time and they will lose some of these good bugs it's important to kind of reintroduce the life back into those soils to circulate the nutrients around. Secondly, we'll talk a bit about pollinators because everybody loves a good pollinator. The really, really coarse definition of a pollinator is basically any animal that moves pollen from the male flower to the female flower. Um, and pollination is a really, really important service, not just um, in agricultural systems, but also in urban areas. There are a lot of plants that rely um, completely on pollination to make their seed set. Um, it's important in some way or another for 87% of flowering plants. And so that's a lot of the plant life that we have in our back gardens. 
Um, everybody knows the, the managed honey, honeybee, which is Apis mellifera. And of course we have them in our urban areas and we'll often see them pollinating. But pollinators is actually um, so much more than just um, the honeybees. In Australia, we're very, very lucky to have a huge array of, of native pollinators. So looking around here, moths can be very, very good pollinators. And there are actually some um, species of flower that have evolved to specifically be pollinated by moths. So if you see flowers that are white and have quite a long tub um, tubular kind of structure, they're often moth pollinated because obviously they're flying around at night and they've got that long um, sucking mouth part that they can use to get down into the flower. You can often tell a lot about what is pollinating a flower from the structure of it. Um, down in the left hand corner down here, we've got a little beetle that's covered in pollen. It's gonna be doing a great job of pollinating when it hops onto a different flower. Um, this insect in the middle is a hoverfly um, and a fly is up in the top right hand corner as well. Flies can be very, very good pollinators. Um, flies get a really bad rap and a lot of people don't like them, but again, they're playing this important service in our back gardens. And down in the right hand corner, there is a tiny little stingless bee, which is a native bee to Australia. And um, we've got a huge array of native and wonderful pollinators in Australia. So moving on to these predators and parasitoids, and I know Jess is going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but I'll give you a general overview. These predators are really important for regulating the populations of other insects. So things like spiders have basically been evolving for hundreds of thousands of years to eat bugs. So they're really good at it. And um, we should definitely be using that service that they provide. Um, in a commercial sense, we call it biological control, which is using a natural enemy like spiders and predatory insects to, to, to deal with the pest problems that we have. You can both have generalists and specialist predators. So a generalist predator is something like a spider that will go and eat a whole lot of different types of pests. But we also have some predators and parasitoids which will only eat one specific type of pest and they can be very useful if you've got one type of pest problem. You can either have natural pest control where you just um, encourage as many different types of predators in your garden as possible or augmented which is actually when you can buy up big loads of a particular predator and release them in your garden. And there are companies that do this. You can buy things um, like ladybirds, which I'll talk about later. Ladybirds are really, really great predators and you can actually release a whole lot of ladybirds in your back gardens to deal with aphid problems. Um, and the really great thing, of course, about using animals to deal with your pest problems is that you don't need to use as many pesticides and you don't have any of those nasty side effects associated with pesticides. And there are actually a lot of agricultural systems that are taking this on board now. There are lots of organic farms who would be relying almost entirely on these predators to do their pest control for them. And we could be doing the same in our back gardens. So I'm gonna talk about some of the common spiders and predatory insects that you might have found in your back garden. Um, I'm just gonna quickly see if I can Okay, I can see the chat now. I just wanted to catch up and see if I had any specific questions before I move on. Okay, great. Um, these are some of the most common spiders that you'll see in your back garden. They're orb weaving spiders. Um, the one that is first along here is, um, it does what it says on the box. It's a leaf curling spider and it's curled up inside a leaf. And they actually use that as a protection. So they, um, it's called a retreat and they hold that leaf in the center of their web and they hide away from birds so that they don't get pecked straight out of the web. And you'll see a lot of them around in your garden almost the whole year round. They're very, very successful. That middle one there is a, a garden orb weaving spider. And as you'll see from the photo there, they're usually around at night. And they're the ones that will build a big web at night. Um, and you will often walk through them on your way to the car in the morning. But they often do also eat up their web during the day so it doesn't get um, disturbed by you or by birds. And then they'll make another web um, when the sun goes down again. And these guys can get quite big. And the third one along there is a, um, a golden orb weaving spider. And these are one of my favourite species of spider because I did my PhD on them. So I know a hell of a lot about them. Um, and they are again quite a large spider. They build these big golden beautiful webs and they're very very good at catching things like moths and flying insects in your gardens. If you're lucky enough to have one in your back garden. But orb weaving spiders also come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So this little um, 
triangular abdomen spider is absolutely gorgeous. It's um, the scientific name is an Arcus spider and they're little orb weavers and they're teeny, teeny tiny. They're probably a quarter of the size of your little fingernail, um, but they're quite common. I found a couple of them in Sydney and there could very well be some in your back garden. These spiky ones on the right hand side, um, the middle one is a two spine spider and they just display the amazing colours and shapes that we have of the spiders in um, the Sydney region. Um, the two spine spiders are also quite common in Sydney back gardens. And more variety in our orb weaving spiders. So orb weaving basically puts any spider into this category that builds that nice kind of typical circular web, but they do all sorts of things as well. So this one in the top right hand corner is called a wraparound spider and you can see it's very good at wrapping around. It's camouflaged across a stick there and they're actually almost impossible to see unless you run your hand across them um, because they're very, very well camouflaged and they're super cute little spiders. The one below that is also camouflaging. It's pretending to be a little stick and um, it will sit there with this amazingly long abdomen. So these are the legs here, the little head. And this is a very, very elongated abdomen that looks like a little piece of stick sticking out. This one here is a scorpion tailed spider. And again, they have a big um, circular orb web, but they sit right in the middle of it and they disguise themselves by um, collecting debris and putting it around them and then sticking their tail up through the middle of it. They're super cute. These are um, both types of orb weavers. This is a bush weaver and this is a, um, another type of triangular orb weaver and um, they're quite common. You might see them in your gardens. Moving on to a different type of spider. These spiders are called crab spiders and they are pollinator specialists. So they sit on the outside of a flower and um, they will sit there and wait until a pollinator comes in to pollinate the flower and then they'll pounce. Um, so that's why they've got these big front legs for grabbing onto the prey as they come in. And you'll see they've got this quite amazing ability to shift the color that they have in order to match the flower that they're sitting on. So if you're in your garden, you've got some daisies around or some wide flat flowers, have a look underneath them because there'll often be a crab spider sitting in the flower there um, waiting for some pollinators to come in. Now jumping spiders are some of the most characteristic types of spiders because um, they're basically the little kittens of the spider world. They're very, very um, alert and very intelligent and they don't build a web to catch their prey. What they do is they run around and they jump. So they've got very, very good depth perception. You can see their big eyes at the front there and they sometimes leave a long line of silk behind them, but they will basically run and they can detect the movement of the prey on um, a leaf and they can see it and they'll run along and jump. And um, there's many, many, many species of jumping spider in, um, in your back gardens and in urban areas. And they're very good at catching small, um, small insects that might be running around on your plants. And um, some of the most famous jumping spiders that have actually only been discovered in the last 10 years or so are these absolutely mind boggling peacock spiders. Um, and if you haven't heard of them before, these peacock spiders are, have this amazing adaptation that they have their abdomen flips up. They've got a colored pattern and, and every species has a different pattern. And this is what the males have. And they do just like a peacock does. When they see a nice female, they flip up their abdomen, they wave it around, and they actually use those long legs with the white tips on the end to dance around and do a dance for the female to see if she's impressed or not. And there's over 160 species of these spiders now. They're teeny, teeny, tiny, but I have found them in people's back gardens before they are there. They live in leaf litter. And um, they're absolutely fascinating and they're finding new species all the time. So it's another really great one to look out for when you're looking for critters in your back gardens. This is just an example to see how tiny they are. So you really have to look hard because they're very, very small and the females are actually small and brown and very, very boring colored. It's only the males that have this beautiful display. And you'll often only see the proper um, waving around display when they've actually seen a female. Otherwise, it kind of it's tucked down underneath. But if you're very lucky, you might see one. Moving on to two more spiders that are really good predators in your gardens. These two spiders have absolutely fascinating ways of catching their prey. Um, so the first one here is the bolus spider. And it has this amazing strategy where it will sit right out on the end of its leaf and it will let down a long strand of silk with a big glob at the end. This is the picture that we can see here. 
And what she does is she sits right out there and she spins that around. And when a moth comes in, she throws it, grabs the moth and reels them back in. But that could be a pretty difficult strategy. You could be waiting around all night for a moth to fly in. So what she does is she actually makes the smell of a female moth. So all the male moths that are out there looking for a female, they smell this pheromone and they come in to investigate. And that's when she swings her bolas and catches them. So this is an absolute marvel of evolution um, that they've evolved this, this two stroke um, strategy with the bolas and with the smell to lure in their prey. It's absolutely fascinating. This other spider here is called an ogre spider. Um, because of these amazing front eyes or a net casting spider because of this net that they hold. So you can see in the picture here, the spider is facing downwards and she spun a web that she holds in her front three or four feet. She hangs facing down and when she sees the movement of her prey, she throws that net like a fisherman, catches her prey and reels it back in. And she needs those huge, huge eyes at the front because she needs absolutely amazing depth perception in order to throw that net to get it in the right spot. Now, ground dwelling spiders are gonna be some of your best friends in back garden and around the house, because they're very, very good at catching things like cockroaches and other pests that might be around your house. Um, this one in the top left-hand corner is a lynx spider. They're quite similar to jumping spiders, except instead of their big eyes to detect their prey, they use those spikes on their legs. They're very, very good at detecting movement. And these spiders are super, super fast. So they'll detect movement and then they'll jump in and collect their prey. The one down the bottom is a wolf spider. And these wolf spiders are quite unique in the spider world in that they're very, very good mums. And this spider is carrying around all of her babies on her back. And she'll do that um, until they're ready to catch their own prey. And um, she basically carries them around for a week or so. Now, one of the sad things about this is you'll often see YouTube videos and things online where someone hits a spider and it explodes and um, millions of other spiders come out. This is usually a mum that's been carrying her baby. So that makes me a little bit sad, um, but it shouldn't freak you out. It's just a nice way of her looking after her kids so they can go off on their own. Um, and of course, down the bottom right hand corner, we have the um, infamous huntsman spider, which you'll also find frequently in your house and gardens. And they do freak people out because they're the large spiders and, um, and okay. mute Robin. Um, so they do freak people out and they are large, but uh, they are very, very good at, um, at eating cockroaches and things. So I would always rather have one cockroach in my house, um, or no, one, one huntsman in my house than having a whole lot of cockroaches. And that's why I'm quite happy to keep them in my house. Now, some of these predatory insects that I was talking about, I said before that ladybirds are really good predators to have in your garden. And they're especially good because they're not just good predators when they're adults, they're good predators when they're babies as well. So up in the top right hand corner, that spiky yellow and black thing is a baby ladybird. And they're very, very good at eating aphids. So you really wanna have um, ladybirds in your gardens if you're dealing with aphid problems. This other beautiful insect on the other side is called a lacewing. And you may recognize the eggs of the lacewing. They often lay them in kind of a, um, a semicircle shape um, and they lay them on these long strings with the little eggs on the end. They hatch out into these nymph-like little um, animals that crawl around. And again, they're very, very good predators both when they're juveniles and when they're adults. Um, so another really good insect to be encouraging in your gardens. Now I put this in here because people often ask me what kind of predators they can have in their garden to deal with mosquitoes. Uh, and mosquitoes is kind of a multi-stage approach that you need in order to deal with them. The most important thing is to monitor the water that you have in your garden. So it's really important to tip out any standing water that you've got or refresh it daily, like bird baths and bromeliads can often have little reservoirs of water in them. But also we can encourage um, any kind of birds, bats and frogs and some particular predatory insects in our gardens to deal with mosquitoes. So one of the best insects that we can use to deal with mosquitoes is these guys. Um, you probably don't recognize them, they live in water, but this is actually a baby dragonfly. So these dragonflies um, hatch out in their juvenile stage underwater. You can see down the bottom here, they've got the most amazing jaws and they're very, very good at eating mosquito larvae. 
So once they are ready to mature, they climb up a reed and they hatch out into dragonflies. And of course, dragonflies are amazing predators as well. So again, really, really big eyes for catching prey and are very good at eating mosquitoes. So dragonflies are a great animal to have in your garden to deal with mosquitoes. But there's also some other um, aquatic bugs that will be able to help you deal with mosquito problems. Skaters and giant water beetles are another good way of dealing with um, mosquitoes in your gardens. If you have a pond and you want to be able to also have the pond but not the mosquitoes. Um, there are also water spiders, which is pretty amazing. So these um, are sometimes called fishing spiders and they will kind of come across the top of the water and will eat things like mosquito larvae and other pests that are around the pond. Uh, and they can even eat fish when they get a little bit larger. I wouldn't worry too much about your koi in your pond, um, but these spiders are able to sit on the edge of a pond and to collect fish as well, which to me is pretty fascinating. So let's talk very quickly about how we can encourage these insects and spiders in our gardens, because it, there's one thing to enjoy them, but it's also important to understand that we've got the right habitats for them in my back, back gardens. It's always good to have vegetation, um, because even if the spiders and the predatory insects don't need them directly, they need the other insects that live on them and they need to lay their eggs somewhere. It's good to have water sources, but of course, um, remember those tips about mosquitoes. I always say it's good to be a lazy gardener because um, these kind of critters love leaf litter, they love long grass. So if you can leave little areas of your garden a little bit more unkept, then that will really encourage some of these, um, these um, these good predators and beneficial insects as well. And basically just let them do their thing. A lot of them will come in as soon as there's um, fewer pesticides and things around and they'll start flourishing just by um, the fact that there's some place there for them to live. I often say that when it comes to spiders, there are only um, two that you really need to worry about controlling, which is redbacks and funnel webs. Um, these are the only two that are really have a risk of harming you or your family. And me personally, I'm quite happy controlling them. I squish redbacks um, and I haven't had to deal with funnel webs yet, but you can deal with them as well. I've got small kids, so that's where I draw the line and I'm quite happy to kill those spiders, but I'll keep the other ones. So when we're talking about the kind of plants that we can have in our gardens, when we want to bring pollinators in, the natives are always great. So grevilleas, bottle brushes, eucalypts and hakeas have the most amazing flowers, which are really wonderful for pollinators. But a lot of pollinators will also feed on non-natives. So anything with a nice flower, things like daisies and lavender, rosemary and basil. Basil's amazing if you've ever seen some pollinators kind of crowding in on the basil and sage are all going to help um, bring pollinators and the predators into your gardens. These predators aren't really picky. As long as there's somewhere for them to live and some food, they'll come. And this is what I'm talking about with lazy gardening. So we don't need a completely manicured garden. It's nice to leave some grass, some leaf litter, barks and stick to leave some habitats for those decomposers and for those predators around. Just to finish up, I'll very quickly say that bee hotels is something that's coming up in a lot of popularity at the moment to encourage um, pollinators in your gardens. And they are, um, they can be a good idea, but a lot of them aren't really tested and you do have to think about what kind of pollinators you're encouraging. So I got this nice little table off the Gardening Australia website and it gives you an idea of the different needs of different types of pollinators. So carpenter bees like to have kind of stems that they can bury into, whereas other ones will need holes or clay to work in. So buying the um, kind of mass produced bee hotels isn't always going to be good because it's not the type of habitat that all types of bees need. And you also have to be aware that there are some um, um, parasites that will come in and will use those bee hotels and can actually increase the, um, the instance of disease within pollinators as well. Um, so you need to make sure that you replace them every year and that you keep them clean. I'll just leave you with a couple of resources that I find really useful if you're trying to um, identify spiders and insects in your garden. The Australian Museum is really fantastic and there's a couple of really good books there as well. And I'm very happy to take any other questions um, on spider identifications. I am just gonna stop sharing my screen now before we go into the guess the bug and we'll have a quick um, question time. We have a few questions coming through, Lizzie. Chat's been quite busy, actually. Sorry, I, I remember that I can't see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. So let's I'll, I'll look through them. 
So um, there is a question from Joe. Uh, what does a bird dropping spider prey on? Ah, that's a really good question. And you've actually answered one of the, um, the, the guess the bugs that I was going to put later <laughs> coming up. You'll be able to see them. Um, that's a good question. I don't think we know. Um, so for a lot of spiders, we don't even have a formal identification for them, let alone a very good idea about what they eat or what eats them. So food webs are super, super complex. And one of the things I always got quizzed on when I was doing my PhD was what did the golden orb weaving spiders eat and what eats them? Now with the golden orb weaving spiders, you can often tell what they've eaten because they keep the prey in their web. So you can actually look over time of the exoskeletons of the insects that are inside the web. Um, but we've still got no idea what eats them. And I don't actually know of, eh, there's not that much research that's been done into bird dropping spiders. So I can pretty confidently say that we've got no idea what they're eating just yet, but that's a good thing about spiders is there's always more research to do. We have another question. Um from Robin, are there funnel web spiders in Melbourne? Um, so there are actually a lot of different types of funnel web. The Sydney funnel web is the one that's notorious for having that super um, dangerous venom. And that's kind of just a fluke of evolution is that they've evolved a venom which is very dangerous to primates, but actually not any other animals. Um, so there are species of funnel web down in Melbourne. I don't know the exact name of the species, but they're not the the dangerous ones that you have to rush immediately to the hospital to, um, like they are in Sydney. But there's also trapdoor spiders and a couple of other different types of spiders like mouse spiders, um, which are all kind of large and have a similar habitat in that they will nest underground. Um, so as far as getting things like that identified, the Australian Museum is always great, or you can take a photo and share them online. There's always um, some good experts online who are happy to identify those kind of things. And uh, a question from Fiona, do spiders eat ticks or are there any insects that eat ticks? Mm, ticks is a good one. I wouldn't say that any spiders or insects would specific, specifically um, prey upon ticks because ticks have got that um, uh, habitat in that their habitat is an animal. So they're living on an animal. The best things that eat ticks are birds. So birds come in and eat ticks quite frequently. Um, and sometimes lizards can as well eat them off other animals. But I don't know of any spiders that do, just because a spider would be very reluctant to crawl onto you to get to the tick in the first place. But there may be some that eat, so ticks go through um, stages of development just like other insects and spiders do. So when they're small, we would say they would be in their early instars and that's before they would particularly bite onto people and they're living on plants. There may be some insects which eat them when they're at that stage, but not that I know of. Thanks, Lizzie. We have a question from Sarah. Are there general indicators that a random bug might be predatory rather than plant eating? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, an indication of a predator is often that they have good jaws at the front. Um, because they need to be able to grab onto something and good eyesight as well. So if you're thinking about an insect that eats a plant, they probably don't need to see very well because they're on the plant and they'll eat it. Whereas if they're a predator, they need to be able to move through their environment, find their prey and catch it. So eyes and jaws are a good indication. But there are things like beetles. I mean, beetles are so diverse and they have pollinators, decomposers and predators and, um, within the beetle family. Uh, and they all have quite similar mouth parts. So there's no hard and fast rule, um, but having a look at how they move around their environment and what kind of mouth parts they have can help. And a good question from Lizzie, are white-tailed spiders as bad as their reputation? Yeah, that is a great question. I get that one all the time. The white-tailed spider is an interesting one in that they have developed that, that reputation over time. What we currently think is that it's not that the white-tailed spiders have a particularly bad venom, um, the fact that they do um, cause some nasty bites sometimes is more of a secondary infection. So they would bite you. It's not a particularly clean bite. And what would happen is that something like a Staphylococcus bacteria infection would get in there and they're very, very difficult to heal sometimes. So that's why people get um, abscesses and long going problems from the spider bite. It's not the spider particularly. It's that um, a bacteria has come in afterwards and infected that, um, that bite. So that's our current understanding of why um, the whitetails have that particular reputation. And this might be a bit of a curly question for you, Lizzie. Is there a natural way to control white ants? White ants as in termites? 
uh, I imagine that might be what is meant by white ants. Perhaps, yeah. Robin, if you could clarify in the chat. I'm assuming, assuming we mean termites. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, there are ways to, to, um, to deal with termites. I mean, one of the best ways is to look at the particular timber that you're building with in the first place. So where there are some timbers like Jarrah that um, termites don't particularly like to go for. But termites is actually, it's a complex problem because there are lots of different species of termites and some are more aggressive as how they move through houses than others. One of the other methods that I've heard for dealing with termites is to have particular plants in your garden which they will preferentially eat. So if you've got um, a plant that they really love, then they'll go into the garden and they'll make their nest within the plant rather than your house. Almost like having um, sacrificial plants in your garden that the pests will eat instead of your vegetables. Um, but I definitely know that there are pest control companies out there that specialise in the natural management of termites rather than using insecticides. So it's, it's not always essential to use chemicals. Great. Thanks, Lizzie. I think that's it for the moment in the chat box. Okay, fantastic. You guys are great. There's some really good questions here. I love it. Um, a predator for whitefly. Oh, that's a specific one. Jess, are you going into specific predators in your section of the talk? Did you want to leave that one to yours or? I go into a little bit more detail on predators, but not to the level of detail as to what whitefly predators there are. There certainly are parasitoid wasps that would mm -hmm. um, have an impact on whiteflies, which I will, um, yeah, I will I generally talk about them. parasitoids. Okay, um, I'll leave that one for Jess then. Thanks, Lizzie. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure there's going to be more questions coming through uh, for you in the chat. Um, look, I'm just going to um, continue on the theme of beneficials, but I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, and mainly because Lizzie is giving me a, a great foundation for, for this short talk. She's already spoken about um, beneficials falling under category of generalist. So um, there are beneficial species, and, and I'm specifically talking here about natural en enemy species, species. So those species of insects that um, predate on other insects. Um, they could be generalist, so a bit more like a, a, like a lion, for instance, um, that can eat a variety of things. Or they might be specialists, so very specific in, in terms of the, um, the host or, or the prey that they choose uh, to eat. And they can also fall into the category of, of resident. So um, they might be a, a natural enemy species that's um, constantly found in, in, in your garden ecosystem and they don't move uh, awfully far. Um, and transient species, so generally those with wings that can move around and these species, um, if you look really carefully, can also um, often be seen sort of um, hunting down populations of aphids and, and laying their eggs within those populations of aphids. So Lizzie's mentioned ladybird beetles. We have a lot of different kinds of ladybird beetles uh, in, in Australia. One that we often would come across uh, in, in Melbourne is a seven spotted ladybird beetle. And it's the adult and the larval um, growth stage of, of this um, type of natural enemy that will predate on um, common insects that you'll find in your gardens, particularly those insects or invertebrates that you'll find um, that are feeding on your um, food crops, um, so your veg veggie patch or, or your um, fruit trees. So you can see here on the right a picture of a ladybird beetle larvae amidst a population of aphid and also the adult at the bottom there. And they tend to, um, they're generalists, so they tend to feed on things like your eggs, um, insect eggs, um, aphids often, and, and perhaps small caterpillars and also mites. So the life cycle of ladybird beetle takes around six weeks, and you can see here it goes through egg stage and the larval stage. And once you get to know what a ladybird beetle larvae looks like, you will see them absolutely everywhere. So here I often walk past them now. Here's one I found just on the wall of my house. Um, and I often find them hanging out on my rose bush at the front of the garden as well, since I get a lot of aphids out there. They go through this pupae stage. So these are quite strange looking cocoons here. 
and then emerges as adults. Someone asked a question earlier about what are some general tips for identifying a um, natural enemy or beneficial species of, of insect from a, um, an insect that might eat your plant. Um, as a general rule of thumb, um, if you have an insect species that is a, that is a plant feeder, um, often their, um, their jaws will point downwards rather than in front. And often if it's a natural en enemy species, the jaws can be um, quite noticeable. So here I've got as an example, uh, carabid beetles. So we have lots of different species of carabid beetles in Australia, and they are what we would term a resident species. So a species that tends to stay in place. And you can see that the larval form at the bottom here looks quite different from the adult form that you can see up top, which is they're feasting on a soft bodied insect there. And if you have a look at this larval form down the bottom, you can see that the jaws on the left are actually quite distinct. So even in the larval form, you can see the jaws sticking out in front and you can see the jaws on the adult form. And I'll click to the next slide because you can see it a little bit better on this um, picture of this adult here. You can see how large those mandibles are all the better to catch and um, feed on, on invertebrates like, like you can see on the right there. Another feature that you might notice if you um, start looking at the natural enemies in your, in your garden is they tend to have um, reasonably strong looking legs. Um, obviously, if, it's a, if this is a predator and it, it gets its food by um, ambushing or, or running after prey, strong legs are, are fairly important. So you can see that on the on the picture here of this carabid adult. Hoverflies um, were also mentioned in, in Lizzie's talk, so I won't go into so much um, the morphology of them. Um, apart from that one set of wings though that Lizzie mentioned as a, as a distinguishing feature um, to identify them from a bee, you might also notice that their body doesn't have that cinch-like waist that you'll see on, for instance, species of wasps. So the waist area is a, is a little bit thicker. Hoverflies, you might also, you might often notice these on, on warm days um, hovering above plants. And if you pay close attention and, and sit down quietly, you can often see them hovering above plants looking for an area to lay their eggs. And it's not uncommon for them to land in the middle of a um, population of aphids and lay their eggs so that their larvae have a ready food source um, when they hatch. And again, once you learn how to identify larvae of a hoverfly, you'll, you'll start seeing them all over the place. So this is a larvae of a hoverfly. It's this lime greeny colour and it also um, often will have a lighter band running the whole length down its back on, on the dorsal side of its back. Because it's a fly larvae, it doesn't have any legs as a larva. It just has these, um, no legs, but, and these darker mouth parts at the front of its body here. And they can be quite voracious. If you ever um, get the chance to have a look at these in the middle of a, a population of aphids, um, they can be quite determined in, um, in taking prey. And, um, and, and, and if you ever get a chance to, to see them feeding, you, you'll get an idea of how much they can eat in over the course of their development. They can be quite voracious. So here's a video of a, a hoverfly larva and it's caught this aphid and it's actually just um, sucking the, the fluid out of the aphid there. So that's another natural enemy that you'll often see in, in your food crop um, garden. And, um, and you can see just how quickly it's, it's eating the aphid. And they're reasonably small, so you do have to look Hard, but if you do notice those hoverfly adults um, hovering above um, plants in your garden and you look closely, you'll most likely see some, some larvae. If not at that point, then in a, in a week afterwards. And then we have lacewings. So these really gorgeous looking um, lacewing adults here. We've got a green lacewing on top and a brown lacewing down the bottom. Uh, there are lots of different kinds and in, in order to really determine the species of a, of a lacewing, it, it can be difficult. It, it, can, it can fall down to the pattern of the veins on their wings. 
but generally um, we have the green lace wings and the brown lace wings and, and we do get both kinds in Melbourne. And the larvae again look quite different to the adults. But you can see here, um, similar to the carabid beetle larvae and adult that I mentioned earlier, they have these really um, noticeable mouth parts. They're more like sickle shape mouth parts and they stick out right in front. And you'll also notice that they have these quite long functional legs. So again, all the better to run after and catch their prey. And they're another type of um, natural enemy that will eat eggs. Um, so someone asked a question about white flies earlier, they could um, eat white fly eggs, but also soft bodied insects like mites and, and aphids. One um, interesting thing about lace wings that um, you'll, you'll see if you look hard enough in your garden, in the case of the green lace wing, they have these really long spines coming off of their body. And they have this habit of placing trash that they find on, on their backs. Um, which might be a bit more like a, like a trophy case, or it might be camouflage. So you can see in this video here, green lacewing larvae is walking around amidst a population of aphids, and it's placing aphid um, malted skins on its back. So it can be quite funny actually seeing these out in the garden and watching them go about their business. So. I raised um, a few in my kitchen for a little while in a, in a cardboard box and, um, and they really enjoyed tearing the cardboard off the box and putting it on their backs. So though that's a bit of an overview of, of some um, more generalist natural enemies that you might see in your garden. And there is another sort of natural enemy that I'm quickly going to talk about called um, parasitoid wasps or sometimes they're called minute wasps. And they come in all of these different forms and they can be quite beautiful. These photos were taken by Leah Pertle, who's on the line today and who will be speaking next week. He's done a lot of work on parasitoid wasps and, and they're, they're absolutely tiny. These are all under the microscope, um, but they do look amazing if you get a chance to see them under the microscope. So there are lots of different kinds of parasitoid wasps and you can get them impacting on pest species at, and, and other insect species, not just pests, um, at all different stages of the life cycle. So you could have them laying their eggs inside an egg, for instance, and then emergence of one parasitoid wasp from that egg laid inside there. Or you might get an egg laid at the larval stage in a caterpillar, for instance, and then it might break out of there at the larval stage, or you might get many laid at the larval stage and many wasps might emerge from that poor caterpillar. You might get an egg laid at the pupae stage, like that. So I actually just wanted to share um, a, 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 a miniature case study from a, a, of a looper that I found in my garden and I collected it. I thought that's quite a, a nice loop. I'll, I'll take that and take some images in, in the lab. So we collected this and I brought this into the office so we could put it under the microscope and get some photos. Uh, however, when we got around to taking some photos 24 hours later, it looked like this. So what looked like a reasonably healthy caterpillar um, the next day was absolutely riddled with these um, of early stage um, pupae. So it, it had been parasitized. A couple of days later, these pupae had started maturing. And you can see a bit of a close up here. You can see these pupae. I've got the arrow pointing at an eye of one of these pupae. So that caterpillar was carrying hundreds and hundreds of these parasitoid wasp um, larvae that a few days later um, are closed and I then had hundreds of these wasps on my hands that I could then release into my garden, which I, which I did. Uh, the video on the top left here was taken by Leah Pertle and it just shows another kind of parasitoid wasp, which is in this case um, impacting on a leaf miner larvae, leaf miner fly larvae, 
and it's a it's an ectoparasitoid so it's actually clung on to the back on the outside of that larvae there and it's um, feeding on the larvae from the outside and just a couple of other images of what parasitoid wasps can do in your garden so these images were taken um, of, of my rose bush um, last spring where I started, I noticed I had a terrible rose aphid problem, but it wasn't too long before I really just left it, before I started noticing these aphid mummies appearing, which are these bronze engorged um, carcasses of aphids. And what's happened is a parasitoid wasp has, um, or, or many wasps likely, have landed amidst this aphid population and started laying eggs in these aphids. And at some stage, the aphids have died and become these mummies, which is a big telltale sign that um, you've got parasitoid wasps in your garden and the wasps will, um, will erupt out of those carcasses as shown in this cartoon down the bottom here. And this video on the right is actually a parasitoid wasp on the hunt for some aphids. And I quite liked this because it came across a hoverfly larvae and the hoverfly larvae was none too pleased when it tried to lay an egg in it and very quickly sent it on its way. And sometimes you get natural enemies feeding on other natural enemies, which is called intraguild predation. So you see a ladybird beetle larvae here feeding on a parasitoid wasp larvae taken out of an aphid mummy. There's a lot that we need to learn about natural enemies. So um, there is a absolute um, recognition in agriculture that they perform a very valuable service but there's still a lot that we don't know around consumption rates and we're still learning um, what is um, really essential to steward these beneficial insects in farming contexts and also in garden contexts. What we can say is there's um, often particularly with these transient beneficials a bit of a lag time when you get a pest population in your garden it might look like quite a, um, a bad population, um, but if you wait a week or two, you'll notice that you, you have some natural enemies in that pest population starting to control it. Um, and eventually they'll, they'll get that population under control. That is of course, if you're not um, impacting on your natural enemy population with um, chemicals, for instance, that can, that can wipe them out. And these natural enemies um, can potentially be quite sensitive. So this is a really interesting study, um, I think that was done in the US and it was a researcher who decided to look at the effects of ambient sound on natural enemy activity. Um, it's quite a well-known study because to look at the effects, he actually played an ACDC song quite loudly um, to ladybird beetles that were set up in a, in a bioassay cage with soybean plants and a population of aphids. And what he found was when he played ACDC quite loudly, and he also played lots of other noises as well, he found that ladybird beetle populations, um, well the ladybird beetles did not reduce the aphid populations as much. So that sound was having an impact on their um, ability to control aphid numbers. Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, we might uh, call this session to a, to a close. Thank you so much everyone for, um, for being a great group. This chat has been um, really very busy from what I can see. If anyone has any further questions, feel free to email us and we can answer those questions over email. And we hope to see you um, next week. You'll be getting a presentation from Malia Pertle from Caesar. <laughs>